I am the third grade GT teacher. That's me. I am Sarah Thompson, and I am teaching the fourth grade GT for the first time this year. Right here, Jenny. Um, I'm Gretchen Lorge. I've been teaching fifth grade for 18 years. This year, I'm doing a four or five split in order to help with our numbers. And I'm Olivia Hinky. I'm helping this year with fifth grade GT as well. So that is our, our, our current uh, GT staff that we have. Uh, I am going to switch at this point to um, a keynote presentation that we have put together. All right, uh, quick thumbs up. Can you guys see it okay? Is the screen up? All right, thank you. So once again, we have a, a, a rather small group uh, that's with us tonight, so we will try to keep this as formal as, as we can. Um, the purpose of this meeting is really for you guys uh, to determine whether uh, our challenge program would be a good fit uh, for your son or daughter. And so I please, I invite you to ask any question that you guys have, um, and we will do our best to answer it. Uh, the purpose of tonight is, is to give you a kind of a, a large overview of our program, uh, the testing, um, really who we are and, and what we do. We will have a second meeting. Uh, and that's going to follow after the testing is done and we announce who the students are that we feel would be a good fit. Uh, there will be a second parent meeting that will go more into depth uh, about some of our curriculum um, and really more to the day to day of, of what the RGT program is and looks like. So uh, I'm going to go through this rather quickly because we just uh, we just went through our introductions. Uh, this year we are working a little different um, because of COVID and, and some of the precautions that we're taking. We did add an extra teacher uh, to the mix um, to get our class sizes a little bit smaller. But one unique thing that I wanted to point out is that um, our second and third grade classrooms really work together as a cohort. And uh, oftentimes you will see kids kind of going back and forth between those two rooms throughout the entire day. Uh, so if you are a second or third grade student coming in, uh, you are really going to have both Mrs. Schwann and Mrs. Reimer um, as your as your classroom teachers. Uh, and fourth and fifth is really something very similar uh, between Mrs. Lords and Ms. Thompson. Uh, they really interact and exchange back and forth as they go through. This year, we, we do due to COVID, a lot of that has changed, um, but they are still finding ways to do that through our virtual presentations and, and WebEx and uh, video conferencing where they can. So a little bit uh, about Riverside. Uh, for some of you that don't know where we are, uh, we are located off of Highway J. Um, if you know where the DC Everest Middle School is, we are fairly close to that. Uh, we are located in the town of Ringle. Uh, Riverside normally has around 525 students in grade, grades K through five. Uh, currently this year due to COVID, we're sitting just a little bit over 400. Uh, so our numbers are are down quite a bit. Uh, in the picture there, uh, you also see Riverside looks a little different than it has recently. We just completed uh, our phase one of our referendum planning, and uh, we have a new multi-purpose space that was added on, a new front office, uh, some new bathrooms, and two additional classrooms uh, in the back of our fourth grade wing. So we have a little bit of a facelift. Um, this slide, and I'm not going to read it uh, word for word, uh, but it really talks about the philosophy that we have uh, around our, our gifted and talented programs. Um, our district is, is really committed to meeting every child and their academic needs. And we understand that uh, there are some students who need some intervention. Um, they may be below, be below grade level and need additional support to help them to get where they need to be. But we also have students that are excelling and are above grade level. And the purpose of this program is really to help those kids uh, reach the full, uh, their fit full capabilities and the full um, aptitude that they have. Um, the program is different than what we would do in our in our traditional classrooms, but yet at the same time, they're still kids. Um, they're still 
eight, nine, 10, 11 year olds. Um, so in that part, we try to keep the, the other aspects of school very, very much the same. Give you a couple more minutes for any of you that are, that are reading the slide. All right, I'm gonna hand it over to Mrs. Lorge a little bit. That's gonna talk a little bit about the distribution of our GT students. Okay, I wanna thank you all for coming tonight. Our purpose tonight is really to um, give you a picture of what a advanced learner at GC Everest looks like. These are students that we think need something different um, than perhaps what they're getting in their current placement. And so we're trying to give you the information you need to help you make that decision if that's your child. So what this is, is a graph of um, IQ of uh, the general population. If you look in the center, the dark orange, that's gonna be where most people fall. And that's gonna be within that average IQ range from 85 to 115. On the left-hand side of that graph, um, towards the 55%, that's gonna be students with disabilities, students who need additional help in um, different academic areas, and also are looking for an adjustment in their academic plan. Our focus for this program are those individuals who are on the right side of the graph. Um, if you notice in like the light tannish orange color, the 13.59%, um, we're really looking at a 120 IQ and higher. So about halfway through that and up would be the, um, the grouping that is a requiring additional academic services from our program that we get um, through testing, which you'll learn about in um, some of the next slides. Um, this is a makeup percentage wise of what kind of population numbers we're talking about. Um, there are uh, geniuses who have IQs of 180, 170. Um, people who have those kind of IQs, even our gifted and talented program at DC Everest probably isn't gonna be enough and they're gonna require additional services above and beyond that might grade and um, advancement, things like that. Um, most of the people who are in our um, population are gonna be those with about 120 to 150 IQ. And so you can see percentage wise, that's a small grouping of the population. And so we really target at the needs of that individualized group. If we have students who score higher than a 150 or a 160, um, then we do what we best we can to create a plan for them though as well. Um, we don't just look at IQ when we're looking at our targeted group as to who's successful in the challenge program. It's really a three tiered approach. Um, because our program is so unique, it is a full day program. It is not a pull out system. We really have to look at the whole child when we are trying to determine what is best for that individual. So uh, above average um, ability is very important. And that's where we find in their academic scores and in their IQ testing. We also are looking for creativity and that doesn't necessarily mean artistic skill. It means out of the box thinking, people who have creative ideas um, really are able to go above and beyond in different conceptual ideas. And then finally, our third component is task commitment. We are their academic program. And so we really need students who are driven, who want to learn, um, who are not afraid to take chances to challenge themselves. And so the overlap in the center of that Venn diagram is where all of three characteristics join together to really create that um, individual that is the most successful in our program. Hi, um, my, I'm Jenny Reimer. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the bright child versus a gifted um, learner. First off, I want to just make sure that when you take a look at this, it's it's not a checklist. It's rather a guide for you to kind of take a look at some of the characteristics. Um, we, as their challenge teachers, understand that they are still little people. They are little ones, they're young children. Um, we're still talking to them about cutting and gluing and um, attention and directions. So these are all things that we 
we understand about our children. However, there are some definite differences. So I'm just going to point out a couple of these or draw your attention to a few and then um, give you a couple examples. So number two is interested versus is highly curious. So recently um, in social studies, the children were working on um, capitals and or states and capitals. So one of our children kind of took the reins. He came in with a map of the world. And he's like, okay, so you know all of these places have capitals too, right? I'm like, yep, they do. So he's taken it upon himself to learn the capitals of all of the countries um, on our planet, and he wants to know what they are abbreviated. So he's very curious. That's a, that's a difference. Um, maybe number three, is attentive or is mentally and physically involved? I get this in my classroom sometimes, um, and I'm sure others can relate, but um, recently I had one of my students say, he went like this to his brain or his head and he's like, oh my gosh, he goes, my brain hurts. I'm using it so much. So he's actually feeling the repercussions of the things that he's trying um, to learn, um, which is really great because he's really putting that effort into it. Um, so you can see he's not only involved, he's physically involved. He's like, he's, his brain was hurting. Um, Number 10 is a big one. Uh, regular classrooms, um, they have to repeat things more often than I would have to repeat in a gifted class. Uh, I repeat things maybe twice, sometimes three times maybe, um, but it's usually once or twice and my kids can move on. Um, so that repetition, um, cuts down time significantly, and then we can keep moving forward. Uh, number 15, um, is receptive, is intense. Um, we have learners who really perseverate on things. Um, they struggle because they, this is, it's harder. Um, there's tears, and that's okay. And we want them to learn how to work through that. And uh, they're 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 often uh, perfectionists, and so when they get things wrong, it is it's an intense moment, and we need to we need to talk about it. Um, so definitely, this happens on a frequent basis within our classroom. Um, enjoy school. Um, enjoys learning. These kids come with a gusto of learning, like they are ready to go. Um, and that I appreciate as well. It's just a little bit different. The other children at school love school too. Um, these kids are ready to learn something even more. Um, and number 19, maybe, um, technician versus inventor. Our children are constantly reimagining things. Um, if they could do this instead, would this be easier? If we could do this instead, would it be better? Um, so these are just a couple of, for instances, on our bright child versus our gifted learner. Remember, it's not a checklist. It's more of a guide. Um, Self-directed learning uh, and on-task commitment are really key factors when we think about our students. Successful students in our program are motivated um, because they find their needs best met here. So. All right, this is Ann Schwan again. Um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of an overview of what's the next steps might be for you. Um, if you feel like your child uh, fits into some of the things we've talked about already today, um, have some of the characteristics that Mrs. Reimer just talked about. Um, the next steps would be for the nomination. Uh, you need, we'll be filling out some forms. Uh, the first one you see here is the ta uh, gifted and talented nomination form or the, just the name, some information about your son or daughter. Um, some of it is completed by you and part of it is also completed by the teacher as well. And we read through all of this information to get a good picture of your child. 
Um, there's another form that you will see as well. Um, it is a teacher inventory where the teachers will, homeroom teachers will read each of the descriptors and give us a one, two, three, or four of where they feel that child is in the regular classroom so that we can get a better feel of how they are overall in behaviors, academics, um, even some of the things as far as even how they play with other, th other kids and their friends. So we get a really good picture of these students. And I believe there is actually one more. Yeah, here's a parent inventory. So there's one also for the parents to fill out. How do you view your child at home? Maybe working with them on homework. Um, how are they when they get with other kids, maybe playing soccer or interest in taking some maybe music lessons, anything like that. Uh, and then how do you see them um, as their role right now in their regular ed classroom? So these forms are all available, I believe, online on at your school website. So if you are interested, that's a place to go or call your school office to keep the process going. So um, Mrs. Schwann is exactly right there. Uh, are, they are posted to every um, elementary school's uh, website page. And if you guys, when you're on your page, if you go to the far left, um, we have a couple things that just stay placed. There's our COVID dashboard uh, and right below that is uh, all of these forms and information is located right there on that link. All right, I think I'm next. Awesome. Um, I am Sarah Thompson, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens after you have nominated your child for the GT program. Um, and um, so the first thing is additional testing will take place. Um, so all students that are nominated are going to complete the following to kind of go along with what Gretchen had talked about earlier with um, the IQ. So figuring out where their IQ is at by using the K-bit, which is specifically IQ. Um, Woodcock Johnson is focused on math and reading, um, starts low and then goes high um, all the way up to mathematical applications. And then we take a writing sample. Um, the other piece that we use, which all DCE students actually take, is our iReady assessment. It is a screener um, that we use for the GT program. So all DCE students actually take it in the fall, um, the winter, which we're currently in the window right now, and will end January 28th. Um, and we will use that as well to kind of um, place your student um, and see where they're at with the IQ and other scores. Um, it has a reading subtest and a math subtest. Um, and these are also, this is also a program that we use with our um, GT students throughout the year um, in class as well. Um, the big thing with the um, other tests, which I missed, sorry, Mr. Campman, um, with the um, placement testing is that it is going to be on site um, and has to be on site. Um, so we will work with you um, as far as taking that uh, those tests with one of our proctors. Um, we will use social distancing. All of the guidelines for um, COVID that are um, in place at our schools will also use for that testing. Um, but it'll be at one of our DCE sites. So if you um, are a DCE student, or if your child is a DCE student, it'll be taken right at the school. If you are not a DCE student, then we'll work with you to try and figure out a location on on campus to um, make that happen. And I believe I got all of it that time. <laughs> You did. So this right here is just an, uh, kind of an overview of our timeline. Uh, this timeline is also online when you click on that link. So you don't have to jot all these dates down. They are already uh, prepared for you there. Um, currently, our nomination window is open and will stay open until the 5th of February. Uh, that is our cutoff date that we have of when we ask the nomination forms uh, to be turned in. At that point is when we start that screening period. And uh, it'll start uh, that following Monday and lead right up until spring break. Uh, like Ms. Thompson said, uh, if you are currently a, a Riverside or a, excuse me, a DC Everest elementary student, uh, it will be done right at your home school. And we will have a proctor that will, that will come and travel to your building to, to do that, uh, that testing. Uh, we are hiring multiple proctors uh, so that we aren't having crossing going between buildings. So there would be someone that is only going to Weston, for example, and only testing students there. Uh, so that we're not having the the, the cross of uh, potential con contamination. Uh, if you are an EVA student, uh, we would work with you on finding um, a, a neutral site of where we could do that. And uh, that could be very open as far as placement. 
Um, our administration building it could be an option where there really is not uh, many people that are that are in that environment. Uh, it would be away from students, and and we will work with parents to try to accommodate uh, as best we can. Um, after our screening period, um, we meet and we do have multiple uh, measures that we look at, uh, like we had shared. Uh, our team will sit down. There is no one uh, test that determines whether you're in or not. Uh, really, it's that profile of what our experience has showed us of, of students that, that has been successful. Um, we will make those decisions by April 9th, and then we will uh, mail those decisions uh, out to parents that day. Uh, we have in the past kind of used snail mail. Uh, last year we switched over to email and I think that worked rather well. So I think we're going to try to continue with that email process just because it can get response uh, to parents quicker. Uh, April 15th, we will be holding another meeting similar to this one, uh, but that's where I had I spoke earlier that we're going to we're going to dig in a little bit deeper into what the curriculum looks like and a little more details of what your child would would be able to expect in that day-to-day uh, -day environment uh, to see if it would be a good fit for you. And then on April 23rd, we ask parents, uh, that's our deadline, uh, to make the decision of what you'd like to do. Uh, one thing uh, that I'd like to stress is um, our gifted and talented program um, isn't better than the, your traditional school or the school that you're, you're currently in. It's different. Um, and the reason that this program exists is that we have identified that there are students that need something more and need something different, and this just provides that opportunity. Uh, they're still going to get fun, fantastic education uh, in any of our buildings. It's just that this program um, is a little bit different as far as the, the scope and sequence of our curriculum, um, how quickly we move through things and, and the pace that we have. And by doing that, it allows other opportunities for us to do um, other activities and kind of dive into some other learning. So I know that we have uh, one question um, in the chat. Um, we'll go ahead and answer that, Hillary. Uh, and then I also have just some commonly asked questions um, that I'll share, and then we will open it up to anyone uh, that have additional questions or, or would like to just have a conversation uh, about our GT program. Uh, so Hillary asked, how are you handling EBA students uh, and the teacher inventory? So we would reach out to your uh, assigned EBA teacher uh, and ask them to give whatever feedback that they are able to share um, from this past year and from their experience. Um, to be honest, we may be reaching out to the building principal as well, just to see uh, your former principal uh, from the, uh, your in-person school that you came from, uh, just to see if we can get any more or additional information. Uh, but that really truly is one, one small piece of everything that we look at. Um, and, and there is no one thing that makes or breaks it. It's just kind of the culmination of everything. So uh, if we don't have a, a lot of information from that EVA uh, teacher, then we would lean heavily on some of the other data points um, that we have. Uh, another question that came up said, how do students joining the program in a late integrate with students who have been in the program longer? Um, I'll start, I'm gonna invite any of the teachers that would like uh, to jump in on this one. Um, every year, we have students that join us at all grade levels. So we have a majority of our students come in at second grade, but almost every year we add second grader or third graders, fourth graders, and fifth graders into our program. Um, our teachers do a fantastic job of, of meeting those students where they're at, uh, really looking at any potential holes uh, of instruction or learning of, of what we need to do to catch up. Um, Normally, by the time you get to the end of the first quarter and we're rolling into second quarter, it is very difficult if you'd walk into that classroom to be able to identify who is a student that's been there for two years and who's the student that joined us. Uh, the other thing is that these classrooms are so used to having new kids join uh, and they are hungry for a new person that comes in, a new friendship, um, that they are very, very welcoming. So from the, the personal and social side, uh, people make friends really, really quickly. They're very welcoming. Um, and like I said, excited when they when they have a new, uh, a new person come in. Uh, question we have, do current GT students retest to stay in the program? No, we do not uh, currently have any of our, our uh, students required to retest. Um, we do evaluate every year though. 
So every year we, we continue to look at the students who are currently in our program and uh, we, we talk and discuss if, if we believe that it is still a good fit. Uh, they're not required to go through the testing per se, but it's more of, of a conference of, of, we feel like this is still a, a good fit for that program. Uh, if for some reason we have any concern that it may not be a good fit, it's not a surprise that all of a sudden you find out you're not in the program the next year. Um, teachers would be reaching out to you uh, and expressing any of the concerns that they may be having as we're moving forward. And we normally would have multiple meetings, uh, three, four meetings, set up a plan of, of what do we want to do? Because our goal is for your child to be successful in this program. Um, and we will do whatever, whatever we can to try to make that work. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to teachers. Anything that you guys want to add about uh, uh, people integrating and coming in or about uh, current students in the program? I can, I can um, talk a little bit about that. Uh, this year um, in third grade, I have five brand new students, five brand new students, um, and they are all doing fantastic. Like Mr. Kingman mentioned, uh, there is a little bit of a learning curve at, at the beginning, um, but these kids are pretty hungry for the knowledge and they really do just kind of dump right on in. Um, and like he said, it's probably after the first quarter or so that you could walk in and not know who's new and who was here the year prior to. So. Thank you, I would Brent. say the one area that um, they do skip a year of math when they come into the challenge program at a later date. And so that, um, that knowing that sometimes they'll do a little work during the summer if they choose to, um, to kind of try and get themselves um, caught up at a self-paced way. Otherwise we're aware of where the holes are and we fill them in during that first quarter and catch them up. So it's a pretty easy transition. And like Mr. Campman said, um, the kids are excited to have new kids and learn, meet new friends. And, and so socially, um, it's a very accepted um, situation as well. So we do have a parent um, that is currently on the call right now uh, who has a child in the program. So Lisa, uh, you volunteered, said you'd be willing to share a little bit about kids entering eight late. Um, please share, us, I guess, your perspective this past year. Sorry, I'm on my phone. I had to figure out how to unmute. Um, <laughs> so my daughter joined um, GT this year as a fourth grader. Um, I'm on the call tonight just because my third grader wants to screen again this year. Um, but um, kind of just mentioning the the gap in math was her biggest challenge for her. Um, and, you know, it's just something that I, as a parent, reached out to the teacher a little bit too, just to make sure that if there were extra things that she could be doing, um, you know, like just encouraging her to to try to keep up as much as she can. Um, she did have a bit of struggles trying entering the friend group and Miss Thompson could, you know, like really worked with Emma to um, help her make that transition too, because those kids um, are willing to add new kids, but they are, they do have strong friend groups. And, you know, things this year probably looked a little bit different because she um, was, the cohorting was even stronger. So she, you know, couldn't sit at lunch with some of her normal friends. And so that was more of a challenge for her, but, um, just reaching out to the teacher and if if your child mentions those things make sure the teacher is aware and they will definitely work with you and your kid to make sure that that transition does work really well thank you lisa uh so mary has a question there and mary i'm going to be honest i don't know how to answer this one in a COVID year uh so she had a question said what is the teacher student ratios um so this year due to COVID, um obviously we have a very very different ratios um I believe in most of our classrooms, we are sitting at, uh, I think we're at 16, 13, 12. Um, I think we have one at 11. Um, so our numbers are, are kind of, of all over, but they're, they're very, very small. Uh, and most of that is, is, is entirely due to COVID. Um, this year, we have a large fifth grade class. And our fifth graders, we have 27 fifth graders who are in the program. Um, and that's why we have those split in between two different uh, rooms. So that's what it is this year in a COVID environment. In a traditional environment, 
Uh, to answer the question that way, we don't fill seats. So it varies year to year uh, of what those class sizes would be. Um, so I mentioned that Mrs. Lorge currently, if, if she was just teaching fifth grade by herself, she would have 27 students in that classroom. My first year as principal, she had 15 students in her classroom. Um, so it's really dependent on a number of people that are nominated and that are up to the program each year. Uh, I would say it is the smallest that we normally run is 15 or 16. Um, and the largest that we run is normally, well, I would say it's, it's similar to what you'd see in other elementary schools. Uh, we've had, have had large years where we get to that 27, 28. Um, if we ever get to a size that have 30 or multiple uh, students, it would be the same as what we would do in a, in any other classroom is we would look at the potential of adding another teacher um, and breaking those, those class sections down. So I hope that um, answers the question, Mary, I guess as best as you can. We don't know what next year is going to bring as far as COVID or protocols or what we're going to have in place, uh, but we will continue to, to adjust you know, really as needed. I'm, I'm very hopeful that we will be getting back to to more of a normal, but I'm not even sure what normal is anymore because our normal, I think, is changing of, of things that we're learning. Um, Hillary has a question that said, we heard busing is available from the home school. Uh, yes, so if you if you live anywhere in the district boundaries, uh, busing will be provided to and from Riverside. Um, the bus routes, I guess this is another important thing for you to know that we do not do transfer routes. We don't have students get on one bus and transfer. Uh, it would be a direct route that would go from your home here to Riverside. Uh, and Lamers does a fantastic job working with us to work on their routes. Uh, so even if you're coming from the far edges of our um, district, uh, they ensure that no one, no students have a bus ride that's an hour or more. We try to make sure that those all those rides are, are less than an hour uh, <clears throat> so we can get students to and from. If, uh, so I, I think you're saying you are part of open enrollment in Hatley. Um, Hillary, if you're willing to share here, do you live in the, the boundaries of DCR or somewhere, or do you live outside of the district boundaries? Sure, we're just outside the district. So currently what we have is if you live outside of the district boundaries, uh, then you would be responsible for transportation to and from school. But normally that would be the same for Hatley, that you would need to provide your own transportation to and from Hatley as well. I don't know if that's your current situation or not. Yep, that is. Thank you. I'm just confirming. Can yep. I speak to that as well? Ironically, um, the farther away from Riverside you live, your bus ride is actually could be shorter um, because we'll have a bus with only challenge students on it. And so it might be eight kids. And so it's a super short ride even out to Corona Water versus if you're actually on a Riverside bus, you're stopping at every house in it. So distance from Riverside doesn't necessarily equate to time on the bus which is kind of a different um, factor of things. That is a great point, Gretchen. Thank you for sharing that. Um, the Sandy, is it uh, Sandy? I wanna say the roundabout. I don't know the name, Sandy Banks, Sandy Circle, Sandy Road, Sandy Drive. Sandy, Sandy Lane. Lane. Sandy Lane. <laughs> I'll get it <laughs> later. Um, that is a, is a very dense population for us. So we, we can have, in a normal year, we may have 60 kids on a bus uh, and they only live you know, a short distance here from Riverside, um, and our students from Corona Wetter are getting off the bus a uh, half hour before they do because they have to stop every so many feet and drop kids off uh, where the bus can just drive straight to Corona Wetter and, and drop kids off. Um, trying to think through other uh, commonly asked questions that we've had. Busing is one that normally comes up. Um, I think it's important to know that uh, your student is still doing all grade level activities. So if you have field trips, and for example, our fourth graders normally go to the Little Red Schoolhouse, um, our fourth grade challenge students also go to the Little Red Schoolhouse. Uh, in fifth grade, they go to the school forest. Our challenge students go to the school forest. So really cheap, we really keep all of those um, experiences and activities very, very much the same, um, but their experience at those places may look a little bit different. Um, Oftentimes, the prep uh, that we do before we go to school for allows uh, some of our students to do some things that might be a little different from another group. Um, 
I think it's also important to know that you're with grade level peers within the building. So if you are going to encore classes, art, music, bi ed, um, you're going at the same time that all the other second graders or third graders in, in your uh, grade level are going. When you go to lunch, lunch is, is together. So all the second graders go to lunch together. When you go to recess, you're with all those, those uh, second graders again. Um, and like Lisa had shared about her child, this year due to cohorting, we're keeping our classes really together in the lunchroom. Uh, where in a normal year, we don't have that and kids can really mingle across the grade level and sit with other kids from other classes. This year due to COVID, we've just really restricted that to, to keep our exposure really as small as possible. Um, other common questions? Um, siblings and their admission, a common question? Yep, perfect. Thank you, Gretchen. Um, if you do have other siblings um, or, or that, that are school-aged, um, we do invite them to, it, to attend Riverside as well. Uh, really, you would have the option if they wanted to stay in your home school, um, but um, we are not in the, the business of breaking up families and have you guys go to multiple locations and multiple spots. So if you do have a second grader that qualifies, but you also have a kindergartner coming in, that kindergartner uh, is, is put at the top of our list to be accepted uh, into the program as well. Um, one thing I do need to clarify on busing, though, is something that has come up in, in years past, is the busing. Uh, if you are from an outside school, that will stay in place as long as you have someone who is in the challenge program. Um, the district put that rule in, uh, I want to say it's probably almost seven or eight years ago now, because we had a couple circumstances where it was a large family and the firstborn uh, was accepted to the challenge program and that student was already gone away at college and there was a new kindergartner coming in. Um, and we were still having busing from, from like across the town from Cronenwetter uh, to bring that student to Riverside. Uh, so the busing will stay in place as long as there's an active student. But even if that busing goes away, your placement here would still stay. It's just then it would switch to parents being responsible for that transportation. I'm gonna look to my, my uh, uh, GT team here. Is there any other common question that you guys can think of that uh, that people asked or would like to know? Do you know what a common question is? Um, how to talk to your student about the testing process? What that looks like? Some people are, um, how to approach it with their students. Students are very, very flexible. And um, when the testers come to talk to them, they try and make it as easy and um, relax situation as possible so that your child doesn't feel stressed about it. Um, but if you have questions about that conversation, we'd be happy to answer that as well. Tara asked um, a question. Um, are our classrooms known as gifted and talented class or is it just our classroom? And my kids just go to Mrs. Reimer's classroom. Um, we're just, that's what we are. Um, who, whoever's the teacher is the teacher. Does that, does that help? We're just, it, we're not known as the gifted and talented class. Yeah, Jennifer, I was just wondering, you know, just like if the kids, like Kevin was kind of saying, like if they were amongst their peers, you know, during recess time and they weren't like, you know, known as the segregated, you know, gifted and talented class. So that's what my question kind of was. Nope. Just, you know, in the kids' eyes, if they kind of were just all part of, you know, that third or second grade class. Please. Yep. I think one of the things, Tara, that really, this is not a new program for the district. Um, I wish I knew exactly how long, but 20 plus years uh, that this program has been in existence. And there's really just this culture. <laughs> Jenny's giving me the thumbs up higher 30 plus years. Um, and, and, and really, it's just part of our school. So um, Mrs. Reimer is just a, a, another third grade teacher. Um, we've had some challenges in years past just due to the layout of our building. So uh, we really want Mrs. Schwann and Mrs. Reimer to be together because they share students and they really go back and forth between those classes. But some of our wings only have six classrooms and we have four classrooms in a grade. So naturally some people end up getting split up and into different parts of the building. With our referendum this next year, one of the things that we're able to do is realign our classrooms so all third graders, no matter if they're in a GT or non-GT, 
are going to be in the same hallway. All fourth graders are all going to be in the same hallway. So we'll have all grade levels together. And then by design, our second and third are sharing a hallway. So Mrs. Reimer and Mr. Schwann are going to be able to share. And our fourth and fifth are sharing a hallway. So Mrs. Lorge and Ms. Thompson are able to share. Um, but I, I really, truly feel like that the, we don't even, we're even trying to get away from gifted and talented as a label. And uh, you'll see a lot of the publications and things that we talk are advanced learners um, and, and trying to, to, I guess, broaden, broaden that scope of how we look at kids. So once again, I'm going to turn this over. Is there any other parents? Um, like I said, we have a very small group on here. So uh, if you have anything, we're more than happy to answer those questions for you guys. You can either put it in the chat or just unmute and, and please feel free to share. Uh, do the students know when they're going to be tested? Um, so this year, we normally don't have a whole lot of warning uh, as far as that testing. Like I said, we have that block of time of when we have. And, and in years past, we have had one proctor that has really moved from, from space to space to space to test them and has set up a schedule. Uh, this year, it's going to be a little bit different because we're trying as much as we can to try to assign proctors just to um, one building or two buildings if we needed to. Um, with that, we would certain weeks that we would have, and we would really work with the teachers and the principals of those buildings uh, to determine when that best fits into their schedule to make that work. Um, one of the things we don't want to do, the, the tests that we have, not tests that you can study for. This isn't something that, okay, tonight we're going to review all of our fractions before you go in. Um, this isn't those type of tests. So it's one of those things that I think when we, if we tell them we're going to test you next week, Tuesday, that causes stress and anxiety, and then they worry about it. That's the last thing that we want them to worry about. Um, the proctor that we've used for many, many years, oftentimes she doesn't even start testing when she first meets them. They sit and they talk and they have a conversation, and she just tries to, to relax. Uh, she has had students in the past where she's like, you want to go for a walk? And she takes them for a walk around the building, uh, one thing, just to try to get them at ease and, and comfortable and, and try to relieve some of the stress and, and help them see this isn't a big deal. Um, it's no different than something you would do in your classroom. Uh, and, and they try to, to really take that approach as, as much as they can. Um, so we're probably not going to be announcing it necessarily to the students, but your teacher would have some general of when they'd be coming in. Any other questions that you guys have? Mr. Campman, I just wanted to put out there, and I'm sure my team would agree with this, um, that if parents uh, want to reach out to us individually um, to ask a question, um, like grade level wise, that they could do that as well. Great. All right. That uncomfortable wait time. All of our teachers are fantastic at it. That uncomfortable silence that the rest of us may not like. They do this all day. <laughs> um, I want to thank you guys for taking the time out of your busy night to come in and, and learn a little bit about our, our gifted and talented program. Um, once again, if you guys do have any questions, please feel free to reach out uh, at any time, and we would be more than happy to, to answer them. Uh, we have limitations this year due to COVID. Um, maybe we can see if we can get a virtual tour or something put together to give you guys a little bit idea of our building and, and what it looks like. Um, I think what we will do here is I will stay on. I'll ask our teachers to stay on. And if any of you guys um, have a question for, for a smaller group, I uh, invite you to stay on to ask that. If not, thank you again for joining us. Um, encourage you to fill out the nomination form and reach out if you have questions. Thank you, everybody. Hey, Kevin, this is Hallie. Hey, Hallie. 
just a question totally off topic um that paper that my mom has yeah um i have it all in my car it's really quite heavy how can i get it to school or what would be best if i just call and somebody comes out and grabs it yeah if, if you even want to just pull up to the front of the building uh one day we can have someone come out there and grab it uh mr brad or myself will would we'll be happy to come out there and grab it from you okay. um, we, you could also pull around to our receiving, uh, but either either way is going to be fine. If you want to just give us a call any day that, or time that you're you're close by, we will make. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And thank you so much for for donating that. We greatly appreciate it. You're welcome. Looks like it is just us group. So I'll be honest. A little nervous about 